you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. The Lord spoke to me this afternoon, and I want to talk to you about pruning for answered prayer. Pruning. What in the world is he talking about? Pruning for answered prayer. Well, look at John 15 and 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. That God prunes us. God prunes the branches. Jesus is the vine, and we're connected to the vine. But if we're going to bear the fruit that he wants us to bear, God must open the eyes of our heart. We must look into his word, and we must be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. So if you want a fruitful prayer life, and if you want to bear much fruit, the branch, which is you and me, it must be pruned. You know, if, if you look at that verse, every branch that bath not fruit, he taketh away. And he whacks that one. I mean, he just cut that one right out, and that one's thrown into the fire. But when God prunes you and me, he's doing that through the word so that you and I can become more productive when it comes to producing the fruit that the branch, which is connected to Jesus Christ, the true vine, should produce. And so God prunes us, and he does that so that we will bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. There's a prayer movement that is taking place right now across this nation. I'm real excited about it. We have had a weekly prayer meeting here, and I've get, given you this before. Every Friday night, and we have been doing corporate prayer for almost 18 years in this church. This past year, I hosted a pastoral prayer meeting for pastors only, and we had anywhere from six to 14 pastors that met here weekly to pray. Some of those pastors told me, said, Pastor Nelson said, you don't have any idea what this prayer life has meant to my own personal Christian development and growth. See, that was a prophecy given at one of our leadership conferences about a revival that would start on the East Coast in Eastern North Carolina, and that revival is going to sweep across this nation. But revivals don't just happen. Revivals are the result of constant prayer. I'm not talking about just a little prayer. Revivals are the result of constant prayer. Someone got to praying like the children of Israel did when they were in uh, Egyptian bondage. And they cried out unto the Lord, and they kept crying so much that God touched a man named Moses at the burning bush, and he sent him down to talk to Pharaoh and to tell him, let my people go. Well, Pharaoh represents the devil. <laughs> and when God's people pray, God begins to move, and he tells the enemy, he tells the, 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 the world of darkness, loose my people and let them go. So, Encounter 2015, this is a prayer movement that's being hosted by Northwood Temple Pentecostal Holiness Church in Fayetteville on January the 5th and January the 6th. That's a Monday and a Tuesday in 2015. Uh, I'm going to try to attend all of it, but it starts one evening around 6 o'clock or 7 and then the next evening they'll pick it up, but it also starts that morning, and working people just can't be there. But I'm going, I'm, I'm already, I already have on my calendar a commitment that I'm going to try to get out of and get it changed so I can go there and be there on that day, uh, Tuesday, January the 6th. I'm really excited about this because this is an unprecedented uh, movement of prayer. It involves leadership, pastors, and prayer warriors from 11 major Pentecostal denominations. That has never happened in the history of the church. And we get to be a part of what God is doing. 
But God is moving because prayer moves the hand of God. And tonight I want to talk to you about the subject of pruning for answered prayer. He's the vine with the branch, and the branch must be pruned. That's what I want us to look at tonight. Father, open the eyes of our heart. We love you. We praise you. And we sense your divine presence here tonight. God, we sense that you are moving because your people are praying. And, Lord, we know the enemy hates prayer, and he does everything he can to keep us from praying. But, Lord, we are committed to prayer. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our heart. I ask you, Holy Spirit, to put a spirit of prayer upon me and upon this church that we constantly pray because that is the will of God. Bless us tonight. Thank you for illuminating our hearts and minds. Let me preach and teach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost, for I can only touch heads, but Holy Ghost, you can touch the heart. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. There are many times we pray and the answer doesn't come right away. So how do we deal with this thing that we call unanswered prayer? This is an issue that we will all have to deal with at some point in our lives. Prayer is conversation with God. Man talking to God, entertaining God, and hearing from God. I like uh, Psalms 25 and 1 where David says, Unto thee, O Lord, will I lift up my soul. That's my favorite definition of prayer. David said, I am turning my mind, my will, and all of my emotions. I'm turning everything in my soul to you, and I'm lifting up my soul. I want to talk with you, Father. I want to hear from you. And that's really what prayer is. Amen. So prayer is conversation with God. It's communication with God. And God wants us to pray because God loves to answer prayer. He loves to answer prayer. So how do we deal with this issue called unanswered prayer? I'm going to get to that. But first of all, point number one, I want to show you that prayer is important. Prayer is important. Prayer is important because it moves the hand of God. Look at Luke 18 and 1. And he, Jesus, spake a parable unto them to this end that men ought always to pray and not faint. Don't quit. Don't ever let a quitting spirit get upon you when you start praying for something. So the first thing I see here in this verse, look at that verse, I see an option. You can pray and you can keep on praying or you can simply quit. Jesus said men should always pray and not faint, not give up, or not quit. So there are options when it comes to prayer. And, and your prayer life will be just as rich and just as wonderful and just as exciting as you make it because you have the option to pray or not to pray. You can pray and ask God for a praying uh, anointing on your life to pray and or you can just pray sometimes. But I love answered prayer, and so that's why I love to pray. Most people, they quit right before the victory. They just quit. If Naaman had stopped praying, you know, the prophet told him, said, you dipped seven times in that muddy Jordan, and I can just see him going down, you know, going down, going down, and he comes up the sixth time, nothing's happened. He'd have quit right there, guess what? He wouldn't have been healed, but he went down seven times. Oh, Daniel, he's praying, and the heavens seem like brass. He's in Babylonian captivity, and God dispatches the angel Gabriel with a message for him, but the, me the messenger can't get there because there's war going on in the heavens. And so God sends the warrior angel, Michael, and Gabriel breaks through, and he said, Hey, Daniel, you're a man highly favored of God. God heard you the first day. God sent the answer the first day, but I was detained by a foul demon spirit, the prince of Persia. So when Elijah was on Mount Carmel praying, he sent his servant out there, and he prayed. He said, do you see any rain? He said, I don't see a thing. And he did, does it for seven times. He had stopped at number six, nothing. But because he continued in prayer, not only was he blessed, the whole nation was blessed, and even the unrighteous were blessed because there was a man 
who was persistent in prayer, he refused to give up. So I'm, I always pray against this quitting spirit. And you've heard me say it. I command that quitting spirit, leave this place in Jesus' name. We'll pray. Prayer warriors and we win. Hallelujah. See, it's a lot easier to give up. It's a lot more restful if you just lay down and quit. But you do have options in prayer. You can decide whether or not you're going to pray it through. I didn't put a little chart up there, but you may have seen the uh, push, P-U-S-A, pray until something happens. You just don't quit. You just, they, the old folks call it praying through. Hallelujah. You, some of you white-headed saints know what I'm talking about. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But you do have an option. But God answers prayer. And God wants us to pray, and he doesn't want us to quit because Jesus said men ought always pray and not faint. Prayer is precious to God. It's important to him. It's so important to God that God records and God keeps the records of his people's prayer. You got a script for that, Pastor? You better believe it. Look at Revelation 5 and 8. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of the odors, which are the prayers of the saints. So God puts our prayers in containers, in golden vials. I mean, they're so precious that he puts them in golden vials. And they are so important to God that they are kept before the throne of God, which is the throne of grace. Now, grace is God's unmerited favor. So if you're praying and your prayer hasn't been answered, that's a golden vial if you're praying right. Now, you know, you can pray amiss. But if you're praying God's will, if you're praying according to his word, if you're praying with the right spirit, and if you're praying a promise and it hasn't come yet, that's a golden vial. And God just tips the prayer bowl. I told you I've been praying for one individual who just got saved 32 years. But he's saved. Glory to God. Now, I wasn't the only one praying. Others were praying. But you know, prayer is such a wonderful thing. But God puts our prayers in golden prayer bowls, prayer vows, right before the throne of grace. And then look at Revelation 8 and 3. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden sense, and that was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar. God likes gold, hallelujah, which is before the throne. So here we find the prayers of all the saints are presented to God like a sweet-smelling savor and incense before the throne of God. Now, the angel here could be none other than the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Only the high priest under the Old Testament could go into the holiest of holies and he would make atonement for his sins and for the sins of the people. He had to, you know, get himself clean. They had the bells on there and a rope around his leg and if he got struck dead, they'd just drag him out. I mean, how'd you like to go in there, you know, that you're going to face the wrath of God if your heart's not clean? Well, that's the purpose of, uh, of this teaching right here is to examine our hearts so that when we go, you know, we're not going to get struck down. We're going to get grace and mercy. Hallelujah. To help in our time of need. But the, old, the high priest in the Old Testament, he had a, a golden censer, and he would stand before the throne of God, and he would take the incense in that, and he would sprinkle it back and forth, back and forth on the prayers that were going up out of that old temple. And in Revelation, what I just read you there, what was the Revelation? Put that back up there, Revelation 8 and 3. Amen. Another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden incense, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which is before the throne. So I want you to see Jesus when you pray. We know he's seated at the right hand of God the Father. That's what the Bible tells us. He gets up when you pray, and he goes to that altar of grace, and he starts sprinkling gold incense on that golden altar from that golden vial. He, and then when your prayers go up before God, I want you to visualize this. Because of 
Jesus, your great high priest, he has sprinkled that incense upon him. It makes your prayers a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. God says you have an option, but I want you to pray and never quit praying because I delight in answering your prayers. Hallelujah. Now, that ought to excite anybody right there. But I, I, I love prayer. And prayer is so important. And there are two things that will live on after you die. When you leave this planet, there are two things that will live on. First of all, your influence will live on. And you've got to live it to give it. If you don't live it, you can't give it to the next generation. But you've got to live it to give it. If you're going to leave something behind, a good influence, you're going to have to live that. If you're going to live a godly heritage behind for the next generation, you've got to live it to give it. Hallelujah. So those two things will live on after we're gone. And, and your prayers, they, many of them, they'll go up and be put in golden vows. I, I know mine are because when my daddy went home to be with heaven, I said, God, let his prayer mantle fall on me. Let me pray for his seed. Remind me every day to pray for my daddy's seed. He's gone. I knew he did that. I would go by his room. The door's locked. Don't go in there. Daddy's talking to his God. And he called our names out in prayer. Many of you had parents like that and grandparents. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But those prayers, they're still there. So, you know, uh, I've, I've got grandchildren. And pretty soon I'll have great-grandchildren. Some of you already have them. But guess what? We may leave this planet, but I'm already storing up prayers. I'm storing my prayers up for coming generations if the Lord should tarry. And that's how powerful prayer is. And I know it's that powerful because I found that in the scriptures. Hallelujah. So don't stop praying. Continue steadfast in prayer. Jesus said men ought to always pray and never quit praying. And he tells us that simply because of the benefits that come from prayer. Point number two, people have to be taught to pray. I like the way Doug Small said it. He said it's better caught than taught. In other words, get around somebody that knows how to pray. Get around a prayer warrior. Sit under the anointing of someone that has studied the subject, that gets their prayers answered. And guess what? It's better caught than taught. And you can catch the spirit of this thing. Prayer is a spirit. It's a spirit, an anointing to do what God has called you to do and, and to win in the world of prayer. And, it, and it's generational. Paul said, Timothy, I want you to stir up the gifts that are in you that came by the laying on of my hands. What an audacity. Paul said, I laid my hands on you, young man, and I passed something. He said, I desire to come and speak to you so I may impart some spiritual gifts to you. Hallelujah. I, you've heard me say it. I want to impart something to the coming generation. I've got something to impart. You've got something to impart. A godly heritage and someone walking with God in the anointing of God and the power of God, that's something wonderful to impart to the next generation. And if you got children out there and they're not doing right, praise God, if you're doing right, don't worry about them. Don't even lose any sleep over it. Just keep on praying. Amen. God says that the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting is righteousness to the children's children to such as keep his covenant. If you're keeping his covenant, don't worry about your children. If you're doing his commandments, don't worry about them. God will bring them in. He may have to whip them to bring them in. He may have to beat them to their knees. He beat me to my knees. Hallelujah. I know it works because I'm a result of it. Hallelujah. Mother and daddy would not quit. And, and the day I got saved, I couldn't get saved unless I drove 60 miles. And when I went in and sat down in the church, my daddy, I sat down beside my mother. My daddy leaned across me and said, I told you he'd be here today, sweetheart. I mean, God gave that man a word of knowledge. He couldn't have known it any other way. 
He had no way of knowing I was on my way up there. That I set my alarm clock at 3 a.m. Because God had been talking to me and told me, you go home to that church, that Pentecostal church you were raised up in. And you give your heart to my son Jesus. He wasn't surprised at all when he come walking out of that Sunday school class. And he saw me sitting over there about where Brother Don is. Came in and sat down beside me. He said, I told you he'd be here today, sweetheart. There are no surprises with God. Hallelujah. The devil can't pull anything out of the fire that he doesn't already have an answer for. Glory to God. So people, they have to be taught how to pray. You know, many people, they feel that it's the job of the educational system to teach their children everything. But parents need to do some teaching because you cannot rely upon the educational system. If they could contradict your teaching, then you've got another world to work in there. You've got to set things straight. My children went to school. One of them went to a Christian school, and I told her, I said, don't ever say anything back about what the teacher teaches. I said, you come talk to me, and I'll straighten your theology out. I said, but that person, they should be given your respect. And they, my daughter was asked to do something no one else in the class was asked to do. I want to write a paper on why we speak in tongues. <laughs> and I gave a few points, and what it would have taken me a 20-page sermon to do, she put in a little thing, and, you know, she nailed it. And after about three weeks, we hadn't got an answer. I said, uh, did you get a grade yet on that? No, I haven't heard a thing. I said, go ask your teacher. He gave you an assignment. I'd like to know what he's doing with it. So she went and talked to him. He said, uh, I'm still looking at it. I'm still studying it. Hallelujah. So, you know, you just don't balk authority. That, that's what's wrong in this nation right now. We got people that, that they, they want to push their way and think, well, they, they're the only one that have an answer. No, if you're in rebellion, you're wrong. If I'm in rebellion, I'm wrong. If anybody's in rebellion to the, to the law and to the authority that God has set up, they are wrong. Amen. So you have to teach your children to pray. You're supposed to be a teacher in your home, and parents should teach their children. Not only do we need to teach speech and hygiene, but we need to teach them how to address God, how to talk to God, how to receive things from God. Parents should teach their children how to pray and to pray. Amen. Leadership should teach and disciple people on prayer. Jesus taught his disciples. You know, I, I, I disciple people all the time. If you're not getting discipled under, under my preaching and my teaching, you're asleep. I just have to tell you like it is. You're just asleep. Amen. And sometimes I, I, I wonder if, if people are asleep. I really do. I, maybe they're just not as excited about this subject matter as I am. I don't know. But look at Luke 11 and 1. It came to pass that as he, Jesus, was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. Not how to pray. He said to pray. So the first important thing is pray. But you got to know how to pray also. Teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. Prayer does not come automatically. We need teaching when it comes to prayer. So Jesus taught his disciples to pray, and he taught them how to pray. But I want you to note that he didn't, they didn't say, teach us how to pray. Teach us to pray. It'd do a lot of people some good if they just pray. 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 Sweet hour of prayer. Sweet hour of prayer. Calls me from a world of care. I get to go to God's throne and make all my wants and wishes known. And he listens to me because I come through the blood of his son. What an audience. Hallelujah. He says, come boldly unto the throne of grace to obtain mercy, to find grace to help in your time of need. So prayer doesn't come automatically. Jesus taught his disciples to pray and how to pray. Look at verse 2. He said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father. So we're to address the Father which art in heaven. 
Hallowed be thy name. We worship him. We, we, we hallow, respect his name. I, I, I can teach you how to pray for one solid hour. And all you'll ever do is say hello. Hello, Father. I can take you through the compound redemptive names. And by the time you finish praying those, I used to pray and walk in the track. And I'd go out and walk for an hour. And I'm saying, hello. <laughs> hello, Father. I mean, he loves it. When you recognize who he is, that he is the most high God, that he is possessor of heaven and earth, that he is a deliverer from every enemy that you face. So he said, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth. So in, as in earth, in heaven. I'm, I'm doing Matthew's version now. <laughs> Hallelujah. But it's found in, in Luke and in Matthew. So Jesus taught the principles of prayer. How to address God the Father. How to petition him for the things that we need. Give us our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us as we forgive others. Amen. That's so important. Not only does Jesus want to teach us to pray, but the Holy Spirit, he assists us in prayer and in teaching us to pray. Look at Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, our weaknesses. We have some flaws, all of us. And we are going to approach a holy God that we just kept singing, holy, holy, holy. And you and me that live in a world of sin and iniquity, and all of that's pressing in on us. I told you I felt like an 18-wheeler. I finally hit gear 18. Amen. Maybe I'm on cruise control right now. Amen. <laughs> but, you know, the Spirit helps us to pray, makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered inarticulate expressions, praying in a prayer language. Uh, get full of the Holy Ghost and, and let the Spirit of God pray for you. So the Holy Spirit helps us pray, and if you use your prayer language, your prayers will be much stronger. We know not what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself maketh intercession for us with groanings. And he that searcheth the heart knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for us. For the saints, according to the will of God. What a powerful gift to be able to pray in the Holy Ghost. To be so full of the Holy Ghost that you pray in tongues at will. I, I say, I just stay full. Praise God. Sometimes I get to preaching and I, and I just I can't, can't preach it in English. It gets too good. I got to preach it in tongues a moment or two. I just get carried over there. Woo! Glory to God. The Holy Ghost, he knows how to pray. And, and when you pray in the Spirit, you bypass the devil. He knows English. He knows all those other languages, but he does not know the prayer language. The devil's got all kind of demons. They speak all kind of languages. They be scratching their heads. What would he say? What would he say? <laughs> devil's over there scratching his head. It's none of his business what you prayed. Amen. Because your prayers just go straight through, right through. See, Daniel didn't have that. Daniel did not have the gift we have. What, why is it, what's so important about speaking in tongues? Because I have a prayer language that God the Father, he understands because the Holy Ghost interprets what's coming out of my spirit. When I don't know how to pray, he prays through my spirit, man. And my spirit is connected in your spirit is connected to God because he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Now, he that is joined unto a woman is one flesh. So that ought to make it real simple. When you get married and you have intimacy into me, see, and you get children out of that, well, what are we supposed to do? We're one spirit with God, and we pray until children are birthed into the kingdom of God. And let's get real about this thing. Hallelujah. I'm one with God. You are one with God. I used to be a sinner, but I'm saved by grace. Glory to God, he took my place. On the cross where he died, my sins to erase. I'm not a sinner anymore. I have God, and you have God's divine nature. 
You have been transformed by the blood of Jesus. Makes me good. Makes me feel good to talk like that. Hallelujah. Because it helps me to realize and, and refresh my memory on who I am in Christ and who you are in Christ. So when you got a situation you don't know exactly how to pray, pray in the Holy Ghost. Amen. Here's what I want to get to. Pruning, point number three, the branch for answered prayer. How do we deal with unanswered prayer? What do we do when we pray and nothing happens? Well, there are reasons that could cause our prayers to go unanswered. Look at number A up there. A prayer may be unanswered. Look at that chart. If it interferes with God's judgment. If your prayer interferes with God's judgment, that prayer is not going to be answered. You, know, you need to remember that. Because if you're praying and nothing is happening, it may be because of God's judgment. Now, think about this. If there had been ten righteous people in Sodom, Abraham... You know, if there were not ten rights, he could have wrung his hands and wrung his hands and jumped up and down, but that wouldn't have done a bit of good. He got down to ten. If there had been ten, guess what? His prayers would have been answered, but he couldn't even find ten. See, God had already said there shall be judgment in that city if there are not ten good, righteous people there. So prayer may be unanswered if it interferes with what God is doing. I, I've had occasions, and my wife will tell you this, people that didn't like what I preached. One boy, you know, I let him suffer two weeks, two solid, might have been three, three weeks. And I just waited. I couldn't get a release to go pray for him. Wouldn't done me a bit of good anyway. Wouldn't done him a bit of good if I'd have gone because of his attitude and because of, his rebellion and God's judgment was on him. And so I waited till the right moment when the Lord released me and I went over there and I talked to an individual and I told him, he said, yes, I'm mad with you. Yes, you preached that and I didn't like it. And you know I have that problem in my life. I said, what am I supposed to do, dance around your sin? I don't think so. And I led him, I showed him in the scriptures where his problem was led him in a prayer of repentance, prayed for him. I said, if I'm not a prophet of God, by what I just told you, I said, you can say that man's a false prophet. And I was still working at Firestone at the time, and I got in my car and backed out the driveway and went on back to work, and he called me and said, before you got your car backed out the driveway, God had healed me. See, you know, that, that people, they, they bring their own problems on this here. God said, touch not my anointing. Do my servant no harm. And any time you put your hand on God, and you know, if you're going to talk about me, please invite me to the party. I'm a big boy. I got a real tough skin. If you're going to be a pastor, you need the mind of a scholar, you need the heart of a child, and the skin of a rhinoceros. I got a real thick skin. So if you want to talk about me, invite me to the party. Because if you talk about me and I'm at the party, God going to whip you. Because I'm not going to do anything to you. And there are some people you can touch and you can get away with it. But I can tell you one thing. I won't do anything to you. So God said, vengeance belongs to me and I will repay. And I learned a long time ago that some battles I don't even have to fight. And people don't believe that, but that's all right. They'll find us out. Hallelujah. And if it's me that's, that's wrong, guess what? I better repent too because that thing goes both ways. Number B, God may allow a prayer to go unanswered if it's related to rebellion, which I just talked about. Oh, Lord, help me to get even with them because they've done me wrong. Well, God's not going to help you to get even with that person. That's just not his nature. He will help you to love them. He will help you to forgive them. But he is not going to help you get even with anybody. So God can't answer a prayer like that. We got to prune the vine. 
not the vine, but prune the branch. Jesus is the vine. So unanswered prayers, sometimes they're related to rebellion. You are rising up against something. And you're rising up against something that God is doing. And you'll find yourself in trouble. And I will too if I rise up like that. If you dislike someone and you say, I hope you have all kinds of bad luck. But I don't live by luck to start with. I'm blessed and highly favored of God. How about you? God, God's not going to answer a prayer like that. God just ignores things like that. God says, vengeance belongs to me. And, and in due course, guess what? God will take care of that problem. I've had to wait a, some years on some of them, but I just say I'll not touch it. I, 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 my wife and I, I just have to say this. You have to get me later. But, but when we were first married, she did not understand divine order. And I would tell her, I'd say, Teresa, I'm going to step in and do this because if I don't, God's going to whip you. I said, I'm going to do this. I said, because here's what the Bible says. And, and we had a hard time working that out because we come out of a culture whose mindset is wrong. And, and it takes years to renew your mind with the word of God. And, and see, I, I can read too. And, and the Bible says, husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And, and so I, I have to love her. And one day I asked her a simple question. I said, every queen wants a king. I said, why wouldn't you let me carry the heavy load? Why wouldn't you want someone that would just make the hard decision. Why wouldn't you want someone that says, I'm willing to bear that? Why wouldn't a woman want someone, someone like that? It'd make a lot of happy homes. That's God's divine order. There are some things that uh, you know you can discuss, but there's a final decision that has to be made, and when that final decision is made, then that responsibility falls to the head of the house, which God said is the man. And that's divine order. It's the same. He said, all authority is of God. He that resists the authority resists God. It's true at work. It's true in the church. It's true anywhere. When that policeman says, stop, you better stop. If you don't, you're going to jail. Amen. God set up order. And then God holds the person that's in authority responsible. They, they have to carry the heavier load. So being the leader is not something that, you know, you always should want. But when God puts you in that position, you better make sure one thing, I'm doing it under divine guidance, divine direction, and in divine order. Hallelujah. Number C. Sometimes unanswered prayers are the result of an attack by the enemy. You know, there's a real devil. I think a lot of our problems are in this area. Look at Job 1 and 12. Job 1 and 12. You might have to look that one up. And, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon him put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. He went forth from the Lord's presence to torment old brother Job. Now, here's a battle that's going on in the spirit world. And God was bragging on Job, how good Job was. And, and the devil says, well, no wonder he's, he loves you so much. He says, you put a hedge around him, you've hedged him in. And, and if he didn't have so many good things, he would curse you to your face. So God let the hedge down. He said, that's not true. He truly loves me. And if I didn't give him a thing, he'd still love me. And the devil said, that's a lie. And so here's Job in the middle of a controversy. And he didn't have anything to do with it. Have you ever wondered about that? Maybe God is just bragging on you when you're going through a hard, difficult place and the devil says you've just blessed them I mean we say it all the time say it with me I am blessed and highly favored of God and the devil says he can't stand it say it again 
I am blessed and highly favored of God. Say it one more time. I am blessed and highly favored. Torment the devil. I am blessed and highly favored of God. Talk to him. Let him hear you talk about your God and how good your God is to you. See, see, Paul, the devil couldn't have gotten to him. God let the hedge down. Said that was a messenger from Satan given to buffet me, if I should be exalted above all measure. He couldn't have gotten to Jesus. I mean, my Lord, God let the hedge down and let him get to him. Thank God. God had a plan. We needed the antidote. Hallelujah. The antidote. The blood that had immunities built in it to deliver us from all sin. So your prayers, you know, you need to check with God and say, Hey, God, are you and the devil having a problem over me? <laughs> and, if, and if he says, Yeah, say, Well, Lord, let me tell you real quick, I'm on your side. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Now, that's in the Bible. And the Bible tells us that even to this day, that the devil is the accuser of the brethren. Number D, unanswered prayer could be a matter of timing. Could just be a matter of timing. In, in Acts chapter 3, there's a man who waited years for healing, but he didn't get healed all at once. But when he did get healed, 5,000 people were saved. No doubt Jesus passed by that place, that gate called beautiful many times. But unanswered prayer, in this case, was only a matter of timing. Jesus knew that if he had healed him when he passed by, that he would have gotten thrown out of the synagogue. And just like that blind man, you know, that he healed it, this lame man would get thrown out of the synagogue. But he said, well, a few days from now, he said, my servants, Peter and John, they're going to come by. And they're going to heal him in my name. And 5,000 people. They're going to come into the kingdom of God. Sometimes it's just a matter of timing. To everything there is a time and a season. For everything under the heavens. And some people get so discouraged when they're not in their season. But if God has said it, it will come to pass. And your season and my season will come if we won't quit. Hallelujah. Just get a... Bulldog bite and say, hallelujah, God said it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen in my case, and it will happen. Now, if God said, I'm coming, you know, and rapture my church away, whether you believe that or not, he's going to do it. <laughs> but when it comes to you personally, you've got to use your faith to obtain the great promises from God. Hallelujah. Look at number E there. The answer could be a matter of fasting and prayer. The disciples prayed for a demonic boy, and he was not healed. Then Jesus told them why he wasn't healed. I mean, they were so embarrassed that they could not heal this boy that they didn't ask him out there in front of everybody. They went into the house alone. They said, Lord, why could we not heal him? And, and look at Matthew 17, 21. Jesus said, how be it? This kind... Matthew 17, 21. You got that, brother? Howbeit this kind goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. So many times, you know, we haven't prepared ourselves to pray a winning prayer. We just haven't. We haven't fasted. And it doesn't move the hand of God. What fasting does, it makes you sensitive to the voice of God. And you can get a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge. You discern the spirit world that you're dealing with because you have denied the flesh, the outer man, and the inner man has been built up strong through prayer and through fasting. I'm telling you how to win great battles. I've applied these things, and they've worked in my life, and they work in anybody's life. Many times we just haven't prepared ourselves. So if you want something great to happen, prepare your life. Through prayer. Jesus said, if you want this kind of miracle, fast and pray before you go and ask for it. He said, then you'll have it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Self-preparation. You want something great from God, enter into your prayer closet and fast and pray to the Lord. 
Get yourself ready for battle so you can pray a winning prayer. Get yourself prepared by petitioning the Father. Father, I need help in this earth. Show me what I'm up against. Lord, help me. Strengthen me. And, and you do that kind of praying in your prayer chamber. And then when you go out to face the enemy on the battlefield, because that's what you're preparing for is for the battle. You prepare your spirit man for the battle, and then you go out, and instead of petitioning the Father in the name of Jesus then, and most preachers have no idea what I'm talking about right here. They just don't. I listen to them pray. They pray prayers of petition. And, and then you say, come out in the name of Jesus. Be healed in Jesus' name. It's called the command of faith. But people that pray long, long prayers in church, when they're praying for the sick, they are prayers of unbelief. That's what they are. They're trying to convince themselves by rehearsing the word over and over. Well, convince yourself in your prayer closet. Get your spirit man built up. So he's about 20 foot tall. And then go out and... When you pray, praise God, the power of God will be there because you have entered into your prayer closet and then when you go out to pray, I, I, I teach this to preachers and they look at me like, and they'll argue with me for a few minutes and then I just show them scripture after scripture after scripture. It works. If you understand and you have prepared your spirit man through prayer, and through fasting. Number F, the answer could be delayed because of disobedience. I mentioned Naaman once before. Naaman was not healed until he followed the prophet's command. I, I, I'm amazed that I preach on healing many times and people just sit there like a knot on the log. I don't understand that. I have preached the word of God under the anointing of God. Your faith should be about Mm, and you should just come and get it. That's the way it works. Stretch forth thy hand. I ain't stretching my hand forth, Jesus. Can't you see my, my hand is with it? Get up and walk. Can't you see? I can't walk, Jesus. That's the way people act. I'm not being hard. I'm just telling you. Spit on the ground, made some mud, put it on, and says, go wash your eyes in the pool of Siloam. Don't you know I'm blind? Don't you know anything, Jesus? I can't see a thing. How am I going to find that pool? Man, if Jesus told me, you know, do this, do this, and this, and, and I knew there was the master there, I'd find somebody that could lead me to that pool. <laughs> Let me tell you. He, he, he tells a bunch of lepers, go show yourself to the priest. We can't go see the priest, Jesus. We don't have any fingers, and we don't have any nose, and we don't have any toes. We are, we are unclean. We can't go do that. It's against the law. The, the Mosaic law says you can't do that. Well, I'm saying you can. You're going to believe the law, or you're going to believe me? I'm bringing grace, God's unmerited favor. Do something. And when we do what we can do, then God does what only God can do. And that's the way faith works. And if you have a problem with that, you will never operate in faith. That's what faith is. Faith says it's so when it's not so, so it can be so because God said it's so. i say that again. Faith says it's so when it's not so, so it can be so because God said it so. And that's how you live in the realm called faith. Hallelujah. But uh, sometimes you just need to pray and fast. Naaman, it was his disobedience. See, when you don't obey God, you cannot get your healing. Look at 2 Kings 5.14. Then he, Naaman, went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God who was... Elisha. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. So his healing was delayed because he got offended. 
He got in his chariot. The Bible says he was wroth because the prophet told him to go down and dip in the muddy Jordan, and he went away. He just drove off. He left mad like a lot of people leave church. Amen. But he left, but he left what? He left the place of miracles. He left the spot that God had ordained for him to go and get a miracle. But he got over his offense. He got his insides right, and that helped a lot of people. Amen. And he came back, and guess what? He obeyed the prophet of God, and he got healed. See, you can't expect God to heal you when you go around with your insides full of bitterness. I preach a little while now. Full of strife and unforgiveness and offense toward others. And if God did heal you, if you were living like that and your insides were all messed up like that, guess what? That sickness would come right back on you because your insides are wrong. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. If a merry heart is good like a medicine, what is an old cantankerous strife, hatred, jealousy, and envy? It puts poison in you. So sometimes prayers are just delayed because people's insides are not right. G, unanswered prayer could be the result of an, a secret sin, something that's not exposed. Nobody knows, but God knows. I tell you, he does. Now, we're going very deep in this thing right now. So if you have prayers that have not been answered, you need to take a look. Take a look at your life. Look at Psalm 66, 18. David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Peter comes along and says, the eyes of the Lord over the righteous, his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. There are a lot of people in the church that they never commit adultery. They don't lie. They don't steal. They don't cheat. But they gossip. They run people down. They have the preacher for lunch. They get together. And say things about him they should never say. And they think, well, God didn't hear that. Let me tell you, God did hear it. And God takes special note. I tell you, he does. The first thing you should do is say, Lord, have I been sinning? Have I been doing wrong? Have I been speaking against others, Lord, when I shouldn't? God, I'm sorry. Please. Clean this thing up in my insides. Lord, make my insides right. See, that's the way you get victory. That's the way you get anointed. That's the way you get answered prayer. But God is not going to let you run down people in the church that he loves just as much as he loves you and let all that bitterness be spewing out of your mouth and then turn around and answer your prayers. He would be an unjust God if he did that. It is sin, it will always be sin, and God will always treat it as sin, and if you're doing it, stop it. Because your prayers will never be answered when you live like that. I'm just trying to help you, hallelujah. Here, look at this H. Your unanswered prayer could be because of your stubbornness. Woo! Look at Zechariah 7 and 12. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. At least they should hear the law and the word which the Lord of hosts has sent by his spirit, by the form of prophet. God said, I'll send you a prophet. I'll put a prophet in your midst to help you. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. People, I'm going to tell you, God said, don't you touch my anointed. And you need to listen to that. And I need to listen to that. And we need to get our act together we need to clean up because it's not just you that's being affected and that bitterness and that poison you're affecting others and you are infecting the body of Christ you're infecting generations to come God hates it 
you don't believe it, go read chapter 6 of Proverbs and find out what God hates. You know God, this God of love, that's something he hates. I'm going to give you an assignment. Go home, read Proverbs chapter 6. See what God says about the things that he hates. Maybe you'll find yourself in there. Hallelujah. They made their hearts hard. God did not do it. No one else did it. Look at that scripture. They made their hearts as an adamant stone, a hard adamant stone. So if you have a hard heart, don't you blame anybody else. You're the one who did it. Mama didn't do it. Daddy didn't do it. The preacher didn't do it. Sunday school teacher didn't do it. The choir director didn't do it. You did it. Amen. I'm so sick and tired of Oh, I, he, he just come out of a wrong family. Mom and daddy did it, and brother did it, and sister did it, and they played a blame game. No, you did it. I mean, you did it. If you got bitterness, if you got hatred, if you got jealousy, if you got envy, and if you got strife, you decided that's how I'm going to live my life. And if you want liberty, you come to Jesus. Amen? And, and you say, Lord, help me. I mean, dear God. I mean, when you need help, you need help. And there's a throne of grace. There's a throne of mercy. And God wants us to be free. So they made their hearts as hard as an adamant stone. And the next verse says that they would not hear God. And this makes me, sometimes I get concerned about my preaching of people listening. So I just back up and teach a little while, you know. Because when you preach, you know, you just throw it out. I mean, it's just going out. But when you teach, you start breaking it down and, you know, you explain it. I like to preach better. Sometimes I have to teach. Hallelujah. <laughs> Listen to this. They would not hear God, and later they call that in prayer. But God said, I'm not going to hear them. Now, I I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help me. <laughs> Amen. I want my prayers answered. Look, look at Zechariah 7, 13. They made their hearts as hard as an adamant stone. The verse, next verse says, Therefore it is come to pass as he cried, and they would not hear. So they cried, and I would not hear, said the Lord of hosts. You called somebody to cry. You broke their heart. You ever wondered how people feel when you crush them? Have you ever wondered for one moment? I mean, you know, I have got a hide as, as, you know, as tough as a rhinoceros. But I'm going to tell you something else. I got feelings too. I do. I do. I really do. So do you. And therefore, we should be kind to one another, like the Bible says. Come here, Brother Philip. Brother Philip was teaching Sunday school along these lines Sunday. He said, I promise you one thing. Tell him what you promised about having the pastor at lunch. <laughs> I said, if you go home and your lunch is roasted pastor, it's not affecting just you. You're passing it on to the next generation. That's right. And he also said, and you won't be doing that at my table either. <laughs> Amen. I appreciate that. Amen. But, but, you know, the more visible you become, the more of a target you are for the enemy. And you just can't please everybody. So do the best you can. Hallelujah. We need to keep our hearts tender if we want answered prayer. There are other things that can hinder our prayers that keep us from getting. But I, I just wanted to list these. I've got this list here that my wife said, please don't teach that again. <laughs> Hindrance is to answer prayer. Your pride. Strife between a husband and a wife. Unforgiveness. Idolatry. Wrong motives. Doubt and unbelief being inconsiderate of the poor and offense. I probably will teach those because I'm going to be teaching on prayer 
And, you know, those things have to be taught over and over and over because our minds must be renewed by the Word of God. And the second thing is that we are subject to drift. And what the Word does, it brings us back in alignment. It's like going and getting your car lined up or going to the chiropractor, you know, and getting an alignment. But we need to keep our hearts tender if we want answered prayer. I have enjoyed answered prayer for more than 32 years. That's why I love to pray. God has answered my prayers on a consistent basis. And I have learned how to pray. And I have learned to pray. And I have learned to persist in prayer. I have learned to pray in the Holy Ghost. I have learned to pray when it seems like nothing is happening. But God's ways are sometimes behind the scene. But I promise you this much. He always works on the scenes that he's behind. Hallelujah. So I love prayer. And I'm going to close with this. I have had to constantly search my heart to see if there's anything in my life that I needed to clean up. And this has been my constant prayer, and many of you have heard me pray it and say it right at the pulpit and around these altars. Look at Psalms 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And that's how you prune the branch so that you can constantly experience answered prayer. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My heart, father is the husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he purgeth it. And every branch that beareth fruit, he pruneth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So if you want answered prayer, get a copy of this lesson. Review it over and over. Because I promise you, if you will take these points and study them point by point, scripture by scripture, the Holy Spirit will reveal something to you that we may not have covered. Can you hold your announcement or you want to do it now? Go on and do it now while you're up here. Um, I did want to say, I forgot to say it earlier, but I know you must have noticed the beautiful flowers on the altar tonight. And those were given uh, by the Evans family in memory of Thomas Evans, who is now going to spend his first Christmas in heaven. And so we will enjoy these through the Christmas holidays and remember Mr. Thomas Evans. Let's stand and just honor the Lord's presence. Hallelujah. I need thee every hour, most gracious yes, Lord. Lord. No tender voice like thine can be so Stay the 
need Lord, Lord. Oh, I need Thee. Oh, I need Thee. Every hour I need I love you, Lord. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come. Sing it again. I need You, Lord. Glory. Oh, I need. 